Well, guys, welcome to my topic on portion control. Uh, this is going to be a continuation of our online classes that I'm doing every other week. If you'd like to see the schedule for the classes, uh, you can find those on my website at foodandfitnessonline.com. I'll go ahead and pull up the link to that and post that into the class notes. At the end of the class, um, it will email you the notes that we take and you'll be able to see that in there. So let me put that in the notes real quick. There we go. Okay, so that's for the online classes. All right, so if you have a question, you can either type it into the box down below or you can unmute your microphone and give me a shout. I'll be happy to uh, answer your question as I go along through the talk. Okay, let's go with portion control. Okay, so why are we talking about portion control and measuring and estimating food? Well, a lot of you guys are interested in weight loss and fat loss or maybe muscle gain. And when it comes down to brass tacks, portion control is going to be the thing that either makes or breaks your ability to gain or lose fat or gain or lose muscle. Uh, the only thing at the end of the day that affects a weight gain or weight loss is going to be calorie balance. Now, yes, it is important that you eat healthy foods, that you incorporate fruits and vegetables, but it's not going to be of the paramount importance that energy imbalance is. So we all know the energy balance equation saying that if you eat more than you expend, you gain weight. If you eat less than you expend, then you lose weight. Okay, so a very simple approach to diet and exercise, if you did want to cut weight, would simply be eat less and move more. Now, the eat less part has a lot of kind of intricacies in it in that we don't always know if we're eating less unless we really dial in our portion control. And there's a number of different things that can affect that. So first what I'd like to start off by doing is beginning this presentation with different methods of portion control, different ways that you can use to be more accurate in the amount of foods that you're eating. Now of course you will have to have some sort of reference to this where either you're looking at the back of your nutrition label using a program like MyFitnessPal or a calorie counting book to where if you do measure one cup of rice or 100 grams of rice for example, you want to be able to know just how many calories are in that. So we're going over the measuring part of that. Okay, so we'll talk about food scales. We'll talk about measuring cups, estimating portion sizes, and that's going to be important as you guys learn to use the food scales and the measuring cups to later estimate. Okay, I often use the analogy of musical instruments to describe things in nutrition. You know, for example, if you learn to play your sheet music in piano or guitar or whatever, you eventually learn to play by ear, right? You get good enough that you don't have to look at sheet music anymore. Well, you're not going to be able to estimate portion sizes accurately unless you put in the time to use your food scales and measuring cups and other methods that we'll go over. I'll talk about food labels and then finally finding the right food in my fitness pal. And I'll end the topic by going over questions and kind of giving you guys some practical application for the topic at hand. And today's going to be a rather short talk, so I won't keep you guys too long. So starting off food scales. Food scales are going to be the most accurate way that you can measure your food or you can control your portion. And it helps to develop a mental portion size. The way that you use a food scale, and I recommend using a digital one, because it has the ability to zero out the scale, or in other words, tear, is kind of the scientific uh, term for that. What you'll do is you'll put a plate on top of the scale, and then you'll hit the tear button or the zero button, and it'll zero things out. Then you can pile food onto your plate. For example, if you're measuring out chicken, you can put chicken on your plate, and because it's zeroed out, it won't weigh the plate, and you can see how many ounces or grams of chicken that you have. You can enter that into your food journal using MyFitnessPal or whatever uh, calorie counting program or application that you're using, and you'll be able to get a very accurate amount uh, using a food scale. Now, when it comes to weighing uh, meats, you typically want to weigh your meats raw. 
Okay, so you'll weigh your chicken before you cook it. Now, if that is inconvenient for you or you have never been doing that, my recommendation is to just be consistent. So you've, if you've always weighed a cooked chicken breast, then continue to do so. If you always weigh it raw, then continue to do that. As I get to the end of the discussion, you'll find that accuracy and consistency go hand in hand. So being consistent is very important. Uh, food scales help to develop mental portion sizes. And I recommend getting your family involved in this to when you weigh a portion of food is to try to get them before you put it on the scale to guess how much it's going to weigh. Okay, And I want you to do that too because that puts you through a mental practice of being able to eventually, like I said, estimate portion sizes. So before you put that chicken breast on your scale, I want you to guess is that an 8 ounce, a 6 ounce, a 10 ounce chicken breast and then see how close you are. You'll find that as you repeat this action more and more that you'll get more and more accurate. Okay, so that helps to develop mental portion sizes as you go along. Now you can see here in the image that I have strawberries placed on the food scale. Objects that are not very small and that may fit kind of funny into a measuring cup are especially going to be important to use on the food scale. Okay, so if I have these strawberries, for example, I could probably fit three strawberries into a cup, or if I'm really playing Tetris, I could probably fit four into a cup and still write that down as a cup, but get two different estimates there. Okay, so measuring cups are going to be 100% accurate with fluids and very accurate with fluid-like things. For example, if I'm using granular sugar, okay, and I'm I'm measuring out a quarter of a cup. Well, because granular sugar has a fluid-like property in the fact that it takes the shape of its container, I'm able to use this with measuring cups with pretty good accuracy. Okay, Other things besides fluids and uh, like sugar would be things like rice, uh, beans, maybe even diced, uh, a, a diced food product as well. So these are going to be less accurate with other foods. So if I go back to my strawberry example, if I were to have these strawberries diced up, sliced, or chopped, it's going to be more accurate to put that into a measuring cup than if I used a food scale. Okay, so you'll find that you'll be using a combination of both of those things, but if you can, always use the food scale. After that, your measuring cup is going to be your next best bet. Okay, so I promised we would get to estimating, so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. When you're estimating foods, you have to understand that this is going to have a smaller amount of accuracy compared to when you're using the other methods that we just went over. Okay, uh, And you can eyeball it, and that works fine, but you can also use your hand if you want as well. So after this talk, what I'd like for you guys to do is to go get your measuring cups and go over these methods to see just how big of um, how much measurement your fist would be, your ounce, your palm, etc. as we go along through here. So you'll first see that if you guys make a fist and you look at that, that should be about a cup. Now here's the thing, you know, well my hand is bigger, her hand is smaller, okay, I understand that. But it's going to give you a ballpark estimate. So what I want you to do is next time you're around your measuring cups is make a fist, look at how much a cup is and see if your fist is either a cup, a cup and a half, or something along those lines. Okay, so the palm at your hand. Take a look at the palm of your hand. Look at the width, the depth, and the thickness of that palm. And that's about gonna be about three ounces of meat. Now for me, my palms are a little bit bigger, so I'm, I'm, I have about five ounces of meat. So my challenge to you is the next time that you're weighing out uh, a meat product is to cut a piece of meat about the size of the palm of your hand. So cut that steak or that chicken breast or whatever to the size of the palm of your hand and then weigh that meat. Whatever that weight is, you now have a very good estimate for how many ounces of meat is when you're out either at a restaurant, at a friend's house, or something along those lines to where you can get a pretty good estimate. Okay, so a handful is going to be about an ounce if you're measuring something like nuts or raisins and two handfuls of something very light. So nuts and raisins are dense. If I'm measuring something like a cereal or a popcorn or pretzels, two small handfuls will be an ounce. Okay. Now, 
guys, here's the here's the caveat of this, or here's where you can get into trouble. If you're estimating before you're ready, before you've had enough practice with the food scale, the measuring cups, you're going to set yourself up for more inaccuracy. Also, you have to kind of look. You have to take a second and evaluate the mental state that you're in before you try to estimate food. If you're very hungry, I've seen people measure a three ounce palm size to actually be an eight ounce chicken, depending on how hungry they are. Okay, so if you're just really starving, you haven't eaten all day, you might want to play devil's advocate against yourself and try to use that food scale or the measuring cup. Okay, so that's just some practical application for you guys there. Your thumb, your whole thumb, should be about an ounce of either peanut butter or hard uh, cheese. And you can see about how much of that thumb would be about a tablespoon. Okay. You can also use um, your thumb tip. So like the tip of your thumb from the nail up would be about a teaspoon. You can use this to measure things like cooking oil, uh, sugar, mayonnaise, and get a pretty good estimate from there. Like I said... The more hungry you are, the more likely you're going to be to be inaccurate, okay, in the wrong direction. The more likely you're going to underestimate. The more delicious a food is, the more likely you're going to be to underestimate. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody think a half a cup of lettuce is a whole cup, and a whole cup of something delicious like ice cream they think is a half a cup. I mean, you just have to accept or realize that if you're estimating it's going to be less accurate. Now that's not to say to just throw it out the window. I want you guys to practice this, practice this and I want you to get good at it. And the more and more you use your measuring cups and the scales, the more accurate you're going to be. Okay. And also the more you kind of take into account and evaluate how hungry you are and how delicious the food is, you can kind of try to be a little more scrutinizing of the portion size. If you got any questions, feel free to click that button that raises your hand. If you have a question, I'll address it or type it in the box. If you don't have any questions, I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so let's take a look at a nutrition facts label, and I'm going to teach you guys how to read that. Okay, so a nutrition facts label is, first of all, you want to look at the amount of servings per container and what a serving size is. Okay, so here we have a can of chicken noodle soup. Now when I eat a can of chicken noodle soup, I eat the whole thing. So to me, for Tony, that's one serving. Okay, but in fact, if you look here at the serving size, the serving size is half of a cup, and servings per container is 2.5. So, so what that means, if I was to eat the whole can of chicken noodle soup, which I typically would, I'm going to have to multiply those calories by 2.5 because that is the amount per serving. So this is where some companies will use a bit of, shall I say, deception and marketing where you have a small bag of chips like that you get at Subway and of course it's a personal bag. You're not going to share that with anybody and the way they give it out is with each person. But if you look at the back, sometimes you'll see that a portion size or a serving size is two per container. And it doesn't make sense because you know you eat the whole pack or whatever, but that's just something that you'll have to look at. So don't just look at the calories first, look at the serving size first. Okay? So remember calories are king, your energy balance, calories in versus calories out, is going to determine whether you're gaining or losing weight. That's going to be very important. But I also want you guys to take a look at protein. Okay? It's important to eat a high amount of protein, especially if you have a weight loss goal, because not only does this help you stay full, and it's more thermogenic, meaning that the more protein you eat, the higher amount of energy that your body has to use to process that protein. It's also going to help repair muscle and to preserve muscle, which is something you want so that you're not losing your metabolic, uh, your ability, sorry, so you're not slowing down your metabolism or losing your metabolic rate as you continue to diet down. This is where yo-yo dieting comes into effect where people lose weight and they gain back more, they lose weight and they gain back more. Often through the process they're losing muscle and then they're gaining back more fat. So this is something to watch out for. So protein and calories and serving sizes. The reason why I'm only having you guys pay attention to these three things 
is because you can get overwhelmed looking at you know the 10 to 15 different things that we have here on the back of the nutrition facts. Remember, keep your keep your goals finite. Try not to have too many and you'll find that you'll be able to stay on task and on target better than if you try to do a hundred different things at once. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Now a lot of you guys, and I see most of you guys here are clients, is that you'll find that you have variants in MyFitnessPal. And MyFitnessPal is the app that we use to track our calories, to see how much calories, protein, etc. is in the foods that we're eating. So this slide is going to be uh, geared a little bit toward that. If you don't currently have MyFitnessPal, I recommend that you download it and use it every day. If you'll notice that when you're using the computer, a uh, function of MyFitnessPal is that foods will either have an asterisk next to it or they won't. Foods without an asterisk usually have 100 or more confirmations, which means that over 100 people have gone in there and confirmed that the calories are accurate for that food. Okay. The other thing is that if you go into the details when you're selecting a food on MyFitnessPal, you'll see the number of confirmations on there as well. You typically want to choose the food that has the higher amount of confirmations. Or if you're me and you're really trying to be good, trying to be good, you'll choose the highest calorie food so that you're always erring on the side of caution. So I hope that makes sense. That if I have between a hundred calorie hamburger and a 200 calorie hamburger and I'm trying to lose weight I'm gonna put in the 200 calorie hamburger and that will help me to make sure that I'm not misestimating my portion sizes and falling into that trap okay and finally third is that you wanna to try to add up the ingredients if it's a mixed dish for example if you go into my fitness pal and you type in spaghetti and meatballs it will have 10 to 20 different spaghetti and meatball recipes. So mom's spaghetti and meatballs, uh, Tony's spaghetti and meatballs, Vinny's spaghetti and meatballs, and they all have different calorie values, different protein, different carbohydrates. So which one do I choose? Well, you can guess and do that, but you're going to be more inaccurate. If you want to be, be the most accurate, what you want to do is you want to choose how much pasta you had, okay, and hopefully you guys are using you're measuring cups or food scales to figure that out. You want to um, put how much meat you have and how much pasta sauce you have. If you have to estimate, that's fine. That's still going to be more accurate than just throwing in random foods. Now I have looked through most of your guys' food journal, if you are a client of mine, and I do see that sometimes there are foods that you choose that are inaccurate. So try to spend a little extra time in entering the higher calorie food or entering in things individually. Okay, finally, entering food in my fitness pal. Like I said, be conservative with your estimates. Okay, be conservative in the fact that you want to choose the higher calorie food. Okay, be skeptical of foods that seem too low in calories. We would all love a 200 calorie Big Mac, but somebody that's entered that in probably has no idea what they're doing. So be skeptical of foods that seem too good to be true. And like I said, choose, go ahead and choose the higher calorie one. Okay, and here's a pro tip for you guys. The more that you eat out, the more that you dine out, the more inaccurate or less accurate you're going to be able to be in assessing the amount of calories that you eat. It's simply a fact. It doesn't matter how healthy the restaurant is or how long you've been going there. I guarantee that nine times, no, that 99 times out of 100, that you're going to be eating more calories than you think you are when you're either eating out or somebody else is serving you the food. There's a lot of different reasons for this and I'm not going to get into all of them but basically you have the company that has how much calories they've decided are going to be in that dish and a lot of times they want this to appeal to the public so they're going to choose a lower calorie option or whatever and then you have the person that's working behind the counter for $8.50 an hour that's serving your food you can see where there's a little bit of discrepancy there in between what they're going to serve you and what the company wants them to serve. Okay, so anytime you enter in a restaurant food, um, do I measure? Okay, Sandy asks real quick, do you measure your pasta before? I'm going to answer that question in a second. Um, beware of restaurant foods; they're never consistent. So, 
um, anytime you enter in a restaurant food, you may want to put in that you like, let's say if I ate one plate and it says one plate is a hundred calories. Okay. I'm just, I'm doing this for simple math. I may go ahead and enter in that I had 1.5 plates or 1.25. And that way I'm getting extra calories into my, my fitness pal, into my food journal and erring on the side of caution. Okay. So that's one method you could use is entering it more. Or if you're going to eat out, make sure that you have a couple hundred calories left over by the end of the day to kind of act as a buffer and don't eat those calories. That's one method you could use. Okay, Sandy asks, do you measure your pasta before? Yes, I always measure my pasta before and what I do is I put my uh, measuring cup, um, like my big one, on my food scale. And I zero out my food scale and then I pour my pasta in there. So that I can get an idea of how many ounces of pasta are per cup. So uh, that can help me to eyeball it because pasta usually grows to about twice its size once you cook it. But I always use the, uh, I, yes, I always use the food scale. So let's say I'm cooking for my family and I measure out eight ounces of pasta. Okay. And I, and I put that in and then I divvy that up into four servings for the entire batch. That means that I probably had two ounces of pasta out of that eight. Okay, so you'll do your best to you'll do your best to estimate after you've cooked it, but you're going to measure it raw. So you'll just you'll simply just have to estimate as best you can. Okay. Emily asks, for breakfast, how much Greek yogurt should I serve myself? Um, I scoop plain Greek yogurt into a bowl to go and a little squirt of honey. I'll answer that question here in a little bit. Let me kind of wrap up with what I have here with my last slide. Okay, so the practical application is to stay consistent. Okay, so if you stay consistent, that's going to help you to move things in one direction or the other because a lot of times we like to move things in percentages. So if I consistently eat the same portion size or, or use this much, that's fine. You can do that and then just dial things back 10%. Okay. That's one way to do it. If you always measure your pasta cooked, you always measure it raw, whatever you do, stay consistent. Okay. Second point, smaller plates and bowls and eating utensils. This is an extremely effective way of being able to lose weight. So for example, Emily, to answer your question is how much Greek yogurt should I serve myself? Well, if your goal is weight loss and you normally serve yourself a certain amount of Greek yogurt. You can start using a smaller container and you don't even have to measure and just by habit and default, you'll be getting in less calories in a smaller portion size. Using smaller bowls, plates, and eating utensils also helps you guys to feel like you're eating more food when you do cut down your portion sizes and that can help from a mental aspect. All right, so if you're not losing weight and you know, you're not sure if you're getting the right kind of portion size, you guys have two options here. Number one is you can cut calories, okay? For example, let's say that I calculate, and this happens, trust me, all the time with clients. I can't, I can't tell you how many times this happens. Guys, you're never going to be 100% accurate. So if I have somebody, for example, on a 1,200 calorie eating plan, and I've calculated and gone through every metabolic equation that on 1,200 calories, this person should be losing about half a pound a week or a pound a week. And I look over their food journal, they're eating consistently 1,200 calories, 1,200 calories, they're not losing weight. Okay, does that mean that they're a metabolic anomaly and that the science and medical field has yet to determine this special type of metabolism? No. What it means is that that person is likely recording and honestly thinks, nobody's trying to, you know, trick anybody here, honestly believes that they're eating 1,200 calories proper. Okay, but what is actually happening happening is that 1,200 calories entered ends up being 14 or 1,500 calories. Okay, it it doesn't matter how accurate you think you are. This is always the case. There is no such thing as starvation mode. Okay, so if you're eating 1,200 calories and you know for a fact that you will lose weight on 1,200 calories, but you're not losing weight, what you need to do is cut your calories. Okay, that is one way to do this. So you can say, all right, I'm eating, and what, what is actually happening is now this person 
is eating, quote, a thousand calories, but what's actually happening is because they're being consistent, which is our point number one, they're being consistent with the amount of calories that they are eating. Now, instead of a thousand, they are eating a, tr a true 1200, okay? And that's just for an example. The other thing is, is that if you don't feel like cutting calories and you're sure that you could clean up your portion sizes a little bit, is you could start dialing in your portion sizes by estimating more on the side of caution by using your food scale and your measuring cups. So what can you do? You can either cut calories or dial in portion sizes, but hey, why not both? I mean, as long as you're able to lose weight at about a pound to half a pound a week, trust me, you're not starving, and you should always let results be your guide. If you're consistently losing three, four, or five pounds a week, then yeah, you've cut back too far. But that's usually not a problem with people. It's usually that we're either stalling out and we're misestimating and we're just not getting the right amount of portion sizes. Okay, so that concludes my talk on portion sizes as far as the prepared uh, talking point. Now I'll get to answer questions. So I'm going to start off by answering Emily's. If you guys have other questions, go ahead and type them in the box here, and I'll get to those at, uh, as I go along. Okay, so Emily asks, for breakfast, how much Greek yogurt should I have? Should I serve myself? Uh, I scoop Greek yogurt in the bowl with a little squirt of honey. Well, there is no such thing as, you know, looking at it at face value as a right or wrong portion size. You have to dial it in for the entire day. Now for example, if you know, if if you eat a whole two cups of Greek yogurt, that's fine. But at the end of the day, if you've eaten over on calories on everything, then you then you would have needed to dial back on everything. So to answer that question is you would first need to find out how many calories you need for the day. And the best way of doing this is, like I've said, going into MyFitnessPal and downloading that app. If you download that app, it'll give you, for example, 1,200 calories to eat in a day. Now, out of that 1,200 calories, you can enter in Greek yogurt and put in a cup and then put in how many teaspoons or tablespoons of honey that you have, and it'll tell you how many of those calories you've used up. If you do that, then that will answer your question because you'll see how many calories you have left over for lunch and dinner and you can really answer that question yourself. If you like eating a bigger breakfast or a smaller breakfast or you want to save food left over for later in the day, that's totally up to you. So there is no real right or wrong to that amount that you should be eating. So I hope I answered your question. Alright guys, any more questions, concerns, doubts, challenges, or confusion with any of the information that I've gone over? Go ahead and give me a thumbs up if I've answered your questions. And if you guys don't have any more questions, go up to that top thing, give me a thumbs up. Okay, great guys. Well, I really appreciate you for joining me today for my online nutrition class. Uh, my next class is going to be on February 15th. And I'm going to go over my guide to grocery shopping. So I'm going to give you guys some really good tips, tricks, and methods for getting healthy foods into your grocery store, for saving some money. And I'll, I think if I get time, I'll even cover a little bit about organic versus non-organic foods. Um, please invite people to come to these nutrition classes. It's something I'm doing free for the public, so I'm happy to have people in. I can have up to 200 people listen in on a conversation at a time. So it's really no problem to invite your friends. Uh, share them on the Facebook page. Check me out at foodandfitnessonline.com and also at Facebook backslash food and fitness. Guys, I'm Tony Paradis, licensed dietitian and personal trainer with Food and Fitness. Thank you for listening to my, talk, my topic today on portion control and I hope to see you again in a couple weeks. I'm out.